And I would like to show you um, some results of our first resequencing data set of European beach, which shows interesting patterns of local adaptation and potential future maladaptation. Now, our group is broadly interested in natural genetic variation of forest trees, and we work on different species and different traits. But what fascinates me most about forest trees is the amount of variation that you find within every species. And this is even true for even aged monocultures such as this beach common garden that I'm showing in this picture. So even there you find differences in growth, in leaf shape, in color. So basically you find quantitative variation for any trait that you're looking at. And this quantitative variation, which is largely controlled by many small effect loci, is what is underlying the evolution of ecotypes and species. Nevertheless, I'm also, and perhaps even more interested in extreme phenotypes that may be caused by rare gene variants or allelic interactions, and may be less important for evolution, but they always remind me of another important selective process, which is the process of domestication. And I, I really like those comparisons of our cultivated crop plants next to their wild relatives. And if we think about the potential of trees for mitigating climate change by fixing carbon dioxide, I think it's really worth also studying possibilities of using artificial selection also in forest trees. But in any case, if you consider the distribution range of forest trees and if you think about climate change, it is of course essential, and that's also the name of the session, that any selected material has to be adapted to future local environments. And this brings me back to the quantitative variation and to our research aim, which was to understand natural genetic variation across the landscape and perhaps even resolve part of the genetic basis of local adaptation across the very broad distribution range of European beach, which is shown in green. So to address this research aim, we took advantage of an already existing common garden of European beach, which was planted back in 1995. So this garden comprises beech trees from 100 populations across the distribution range, so from northern Spain all the way to southern Sweden and also to Romania, not far from where we are at the moment. These trees were planted together and one of the common gardens is close to our institute in northern Germany. It comprises three hectares, so we have three plots and originally each of those plots had 50 trees per population, so in total 15,000 trees. And today, about 7,000 are still growing there happily. And we selected, we selected nine trees per block in provenance, so totaling 1,800 trees. In 2021, we sampled the first 900, and last year we selected and sampled another 900. So we have DNA of 1,800 trees from 100 populations across the range. In the first resequencing, experiment. We managed to get Illumina resequencing data of 865, so more or less nine individuals per population, and we used the relatively high coverage to be able to also relatively confidently call rare alleles. We did the variant calling with GATK, and our final filtered data set consists of 540,000 unlinked SNPs. And, in those, and we had to remove for our landscape genomics analysis some related individuals as Christian mentioned, we always have some cousins and half sips, so we are left with 630 unrelated individuals. And the first results are uploaded to BioArchive, so if you're interested more in more details of the data set or the bioinformatics, check out the preprint. Now, if we visualize the variation of those 630 trees based on the 500,000 SNPs in a principal component analysis, you see a very clear structuring. Also, you see that it's only a small part of the total genomic variance that is explained by the first two principal components, so it's about 1% each. But nevertheless, those 2% of the genomic variation, they carry a very important geographic information. So if we now color these trees based on the country of their origin, 
and we overlay the results of the PCA with the map of Europe, we can see that there's a very striking correlation between genetics and geography. So the trees from the Spanish populations are colored in red down here, then the trees from France, Germany, Denmark, Sweden. So there's a very close correlation between genetics and geography. And if we take the average value for each of the 100 populations for the principal component one for PC1 and project that on the map of Europe, you see a very clear climb, and actually the mean PC1 correlates, there's a correlation coefficient of 95% with longitude. So this means that our colleagues in the 1990s, they did a great job organizing almost 200,000 beech seedlings, planting them all across Europe in 30 different common gardens. But also it means that we're looking at largely autochthonous populations, which allows us to try to understand the genetic basis of local adaptation. So if we look at bioclimatic variables across those 100 populations from the WorldClim database, we see that they exhibit very broad distributions. So for example, one of the most important temperature variables for shaping the distribution range, the current distribution range of beach is the temperature annual range, so the difference between minimum and maximum temperatures of the year. And you see that our populations have ranges of temperature annual range between 20 degrees and more than 30 degrees Celsius. And one of the most important precipitation variables, precipitation of the warmest quarter, ranges from 100 to 500 millimeters. So this is in line with this very broad ecological amplitude of European beach, and it indicates that there may be strong selection going on for local adaptation, which we may identify by doing genotype environment associations. So I would like to show you a genotype environment association exemplified by the precipitation of warmest quarter. And so what I'm showing is the association, the minus log 10 p-value of our 500,000 unlinked SNPs across the 12 beach chromosomes, and the association with precipitation in summer. And you see that there is many significant associations across all chromosomes. So across the entire genome, we have thousands of significant associations, which indicates that local adaptation has a highly complex genetic architecture, which makes perfect sense from an evolutionary point of view. And this is true also for other bioclimatic variables. So it seems that adaptation to average climate variables depends on many small effect loci scattered across the genome. Interestingly, if we look at some individual associated, so putatively adaptive variants, and let's just do this for this highly significant one on chromosome 2, but the picture is very similar for many of the adaptive variants. We see that the putatively adaptive variants are actually common and segregate across the landscape. So it's not unique variants that are exclusive and adapt a certain population to a certain climate, but it's actually variants that you find across the entire range but you, of course, see differences in the relief frequencies. So, for example, this variant is much more frequent in the continental part of the range. It's also more frequent in some high altitude populations in Germany and also in France. But in principle, the adaptive variants are present in every population, suggesting that, in principle, there is a relatively high adaptive potential across the range. Nevertheless, to adapt to future environmental conditions, to future climate, all these populations will, of course, need many allele frequency changes at a large number of adaptive loci. And to understand if this is possible, we actually also looked at a genomic offset measure, which was developed by Christian Reichert, the previous speaker, back in 2016, which is called risk of non-adaptiveness. And it basically asks the question, it looks at the leaf frequency in the present population and at the needed frequency under future conditions, and it will just calculate the distance in a leaf frequency. It does this over all the thousand of significant associations, and you get the final genomic offset value. So we again looked at these two important bioclimatic variables, 
annual temperature range and summer precipitation. And what I'm showing you here is the predicted climate change under a moderate climate change scenario. So it's RCP 4.5. The model is from the Max Planck Institute. And you see the temperature annual range is predicted to increase, so the extremes will be further apart. And especially in the southern part of the range, annual range will increase by about 3%. Precipitation in summer will decrease. Again, it's the southern part which will experience stronger changes in climate and it's reductions of more than 60 millimeters that are predicted. If we now take the associated alleles associated with Bio7 and Bio18 and we calculate the genomic offset, we find broad and fine scale variation. So for Bio7, we find large offset values of up to 3% in, in Spain and France. For precipitation, we find higher offsets in the continental part of the distribution. But interestingly, we also find fine scale variations. So if we zoom into some German populations, there are some populations that are growing really close together and still they show very different values for the risk of non-adaptedness. And so this tells us that the environmental variable that you're looking at to predict genomic offset is very important. And also it tells us that we have to look in a high spatial resolution because interpolating the data might not work if you have really differences between neighboring populations. We will hear much more about the challenges but also the chances of genomic offset on Wednesday. I think one thing that we can conclude is really important to validate these results. And unfortunately, our common garden in northern Germany, the beech trees are all growing fine because there's no extreme cold, there's no heat, there's always nice precipitation. So there's actually no differentiation in growth between the populations, but they're all growing very similar. So I would really like to advocate for initiating new trials across Europe and select conditions which might mirror future predicted environmental conditions. All right, I have two more slides where I want to show future and ongoing work. So originally we set out not to do genotype environment associations, but we were actually interested in the phenotypes of the individuals which grow together in our common garden site. And so we are still following this. We finally have the drone-based phenotyping, which also does multispectral images. And so we are now phenotyping our 1,800 trees. We are also genetically analyzing the, the remaining 900. And we're already finding some interesting peaks, for example, for spring phenology, which has high heritability and there is really an amazing variation with a single tree always being in full, full of leaves in early in April while the others just follow in May. However, if we look at, for example, this one very strong association of the phenology GWAS, there's no interesting gene, so we find peaks in the middle of nowhere. And that's the reason why we're also now pursuing Oxford Nanopore Technologies long read sequencing. So we're taking beech trees from Spain, from Sweden, and we're producing long reads to really get a more complete representation of the gene space of European beech. And I'm very happy to have a new postdoc since last week working on that. This brings me to my conclusions. So I really think that genomic analysis give us first insights into the local adaptation. We can estimate maladaptation, but we really need the rigorous validation. We need new trial sites specifically designed for this purpose. And to end on a positive note, I think that these high levels of variation in forest trees, they really provide a great potential. And I look forward to continue working on forest genomics for the next years. So just shortly thanking especially Matthias, Connie, Annika and Stefan, and also many other colleagues for helpful comments and discussions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Niels, for the great talk. I think now we, he will be happy about questions. Are there any questions for Niels? Yes, please, Johan. So, uh, thank you. Great, great talk. About the, the uh, risk of non-adaptation, so yes. you show a scale of numbers. Yes. Considering that we know and you showed that there is a great variation within each population, how much is that? Is it, is it a, 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 a very 
a big thing to require that change of relative frequencies, or do you think that, well, there's so much variation in populations that after all, that's a very good question, a very important point. Yes, I forgot to mention. So Christian already showed one example of stone pine where they could show about 2% LE frequency changes within one population, which happened at adaptive and also neutral sites. So these values, I, I try to color them more or less. So the yellow is more or less at 2%, which I would consider perhaps possible. It also depends on the selection intensity. But then all the populations with higher values, they might not be able to to acquire these allele frequency changes, especially since it's so polygenic. So selection cannot, will not change allele frequencies so much. And also this is a moderate scenario, so if we do the RCP 8.5, all the values increase a lot and we, they go closer to 10%. But you have a very good point. So individual-wise, there are many individuals that as an individual, they're actually pre-adapted. But population-wise, and selection or adaptation works on the population. I think it will be challenging. But we should further test, so we don't have empirical data for beach, as far as I'm aware. Thank you very much. Are there more questions? Yes, Christian. Thank you, Niels. At the end, you said you needed uh, this genomic offset uh, calculations need validation but actually you have it in front of you because of the common garden, you can actually relate your genomic offset values to how these populations perform in the common garden, related in, how do you say, relative to their home environment, as I guess Brandon will discuss on Wednesday. So you have it there, you could, at least for one garden, you could do a validation. Totally right, yes. The problem is that the populations, they don't differ in their common garden because this common garden is just... So in the, back in the 90s, they had these really was 176,000 seedlings and they wanted maximum survival. They wanted these experiments to grow nicely. And so they selected sites with moderate conditions, so no stressful sites. And so the site close to Hamburg is actually so nice for the beech trees that the population... So if I look at growth at, at circumference of the 1,800 trees, it's only 2% that is explained by population. And of those 2%, I can explain 1% by genomic offset, but it's like value so small that it's, yeah, the models are not really robust. So I would really like sites that are in the environment where the stressful condition will cause mortality or problems to many populations that have red points in the offset predictions to really see if it's correct. And also to then disentangle the environmental variables and their importance. Because as you see here, it depends a lot, and you also showed that if you use a precipitation variable or a temperature variable, you can get very different offset values. So it will be also very interesting to then use some future sites which have stressful conditions related to precipitation, and others, they might have stressful conditions with the temperature annual range. Thank you very much. Um, are there more questions? I have a question. So you mentioned it, it is an EU FRO trial, isn't it? Or no, it's not coming from an EU FRO program at some point. So Katharina will tell more about the trial on Thursday, I think. So I think it's not. It's an international beach provenance trial. And there were so many common garden trials at that time. But I believe it's not a EU FRO trial, but it's an international beach provenance trial. And there were several series. And that's the series 13, uh, 93, 95. And there's no replicate left in another There is, so actually country. there are more gardens, one even close to where we are at the moment. So every blue square is one common garden that was planted. But all of these common gardens have high levels of precipitation. They, it's like it looks very diverse, but then it's high altitude gardens in the countries that are, they actually have more stressful conditions. And so we checked for regions that might represent future climate yeah. and uh, among those sites we could not find the the really ideal sites unfortunately okay otherwise it's an amazing <laughs> set of common yeah <laughs> thank you very much you. anya please so <clears throat> this results on the gea uh, where it seems to be very, very polygenic adaptation and then it ad in addition, your result that the, many of the alleles are quite widespread. So in summary, is, isn't that a good, 
good news for the adaptation that um, then maybe for looking at what happens in the individual loci is not that important or what do you think? I, I would totally agree, yes. So I, I'm very optimistic when seeing this picture because yeah, the more polygenic, the better evolution. I mean, so theoretical studies show that evolution works best when, they're, when it's highly polygenic and it's common alleles. So it's kind of like expected and I think it's, it's a good thing for the potential of adaptation to future conditions. We need to also say that we can only identify part of the genetics underlying local adaptation because not all causative alleles will evolve clients. But yes, even by just even this part is already highly highly complex, and I think it's a good it's good news for the beach. I hope so. But the climate change is also really fast. So, like Ivan's question, how fast can allele frequencies change, and how many loads I need to change? That will be the important question. Thank you very much for your great talk.